Hey, what's up, folks? I've been doing some design and performance and engineering work on one of my websites called GeoPortal. And the main goal there was to get the site as performant as possible in every sense. And, and page size and time to first paint and perceptual speed and actual speed, best practices, all that kind of stuff. And I've gotten as far as I can go. And I wanted to stop there and share with you some of the different things I did and what they do for performance and the tools I use and how you can incorporate that into your own build process. So let's jump right into it. Boom. This is the new uh, prototype layout for GeoPortal. Visually, it's almost the same as the old one. The only real visible difference is the sidebar. The sidebar in the old one was always open uh, on a desktop screen and on a mobile screen or a smaller resolution. It was hidden behind a hamburger menu like this. And what I've done instead is I've made it always open like this whether it's mobile or a desktop screen. So you have a similar experience either way. And you can pick the various uh, tabs and it'll show you which one you're on. And then you can toggle the menu to see the full description. And from usability perspective, this gives us a couple things. One, it's, it's always visible. So uh, things that aren't visible, you shouldn't plan on your users always seeing. And something like this is very important that they see. So on a mobile phone, this was invisible by default. So it's good to have it always visible. If you've been to the site enough times to recognize the icons, you don't ever need to open it. On a full screen, you have a lot more space now since it's just closed like this. So it's, there's a lot of usability improvements with that. And also when it opens, you notice know, so what it does is it just shifts the content off the screen a bit to show that. And by doing a, a transform 3D, which is what it's doing, rather than changing the margin of the content, because this is just always below the content, uh, by doing that transform 3D, it doesn't have to reflow the content. It doesn't have to realign text and everything when that content shrinks. So by doing a transform 3D, it's it, you can see it's, it's just silky smooth, which is nice. We like silky smooth. So that's really the only visual change to the site. Most of it's been under the hood, but the test scores are nice. I'm using Lighthouse to benchmark this. Lighthouse you can find in your Chrome DevTools. Control Shift J or Control or Command Shift J or Latte Shift J, whatever it is on a Mac. Uh, open those up and the last tab will be Audits. Run Perform and Audit. Pick all of them. Hit Go. And what it's doing is it's formatting it for a, a mobile size screen. It is checking your progressive web app. So seeing if it loads offline, it's doing all kinds of different tests on it. And I'll come back and give you the results. And the results here, let me make this a little bigger for you. I didn't really want you bigger, but I guess that's okay. We've got, uh, a 96 for performance and hundreds across the board. So 100 for progressive web app, accessibility, best practices, and SEO, and 96 for performance. And that 96 for performance is never, ever getting higher. To get that any higher, I think I'd have to replace the whole site with a paragraph tag and some text. And uh, I'm not doing that. So let's take a look at performance. Notice our first meaningful paint is below a second. and as you run Lighthouse, you'll get different scores. They, they can vary slightly. It's always below a second. Usually it's it's in the 700 milliseconds, but it's 900 here. Uh, that's great. What that's telling us is that users will be able to see content before a second is out. And that's a really good threshold to set. You want uh, the content there as fast as you possibly can. Because performance is... Uh, there's actual performance and there's perceptual performance. Perceptual performance is arguably more important. Like it, if it took 10 seconds for the site to be perfectly useful, 
but the initial page load or initial paint happened with before the first second was out, people will think that's faster than a site that takes five seconds to be all ready, but it took three seconds for that initial paint to go. Now, uh, I just made up those numbers, but I'm pretty sure that's true. So perceptual performance is very important. So the initial paint is under a second. We're in about three seconds, everything's ready. Our perceptual index is 99, which is awesome. Input latency is around 25 milliseconds, which is also awesome. So performance very good. Progressive web app tests all your progressive web app stuff. It's good. Accessibility is 100. The accessibility testing tools, if you run your site through this and you don't get 100, please change your site and get to 100. It will make a big difference to people you will probably never meet, but people you would, if you did meet, you'd be glad to help. So uh, getting accessibility to 100 isn't really as hard as you think. So make that happen. Best practice is 100. SEO. SEO, usually think about in terms of people that are pushing ads, which really isn't my bag, but SEO is actually important for, it runs some tests there that are, that are important for all your users. Like I started out an SEO score of 89, and that was for one reason. And that was my text wasn't big enough. Uh, text sizes are getting bigger. Now 16 pixels is considered the standard. Or six, yeah, 16 pixels. A lot of sites go bigger than that. Uh, CSS Tricks, I think, is like 20 or 21. So I upped the, the font size, which rippled down through the site, and that got that SEO score up to 100. So 96 and 100s is really, really good if you haven't run these kind of tests before. Most uh, best practice, like to-do lists and stuff, don't get this high of a score. So very happy with this. Let's take a look at how we made this happen. Let's see. Okay. I am using NPM scripts to run any, everything. I, uh, my, my brief love affair with Parcel uh, hit a snag when Parcel, for whatever reason, can't seem to build Mapbox GL JS correctly. Whenever it bundles that, it does not work. So I'm doing NPM scripts now. Uh, and the way I'm building and the stuff I've done, I mentioned too in terms of performance, the JavaScript before I started this work was uh, like 1,184 kilobytes over a meg. This is, this is before gzipping, of course. And now it's 876 kilobytes. So we're getting a big savings there. Uh, I also used to load the Mapbox GLJS JSON styling separately in a different file, which is dumb. So now I am just bundling that with everything else. And that's part of that 876. So that's another 72 kilobytes that were saved. CSS went from 156 kilobytes to 61. And I went from nine, nine images to six. And that went from 324 kilobytes to 188 kilobytes. So I saved 611 kilobytes and six network calls. So... That's good. That's good. That, that's good. Go me. Now, there's two main processing steps going on. One's for CSS and one's for JavaScript. JavaScript is using Webpack. And I know I, I say I don't like Webpack. And that's true for things that are not JavaScript. Uh, using Webpack, like sucking CSS into your JavaScript do you run through 10 Webpack modules to blast back out the back end as a CSS file again is, that's just crazy. So there's stuff with Webpack that isn't JS, drives me nuts. Webpack for just JavaScript is actually quite nice. So we're using Webpack 4. We're going Webpack mode development progress watch. And this is for development mode and watch what that does if you change your JavaScript while it's watching. It uh, does incremental building, so it's very, very fast. It doesn't rebuild the whole thing, just what it needs to. Webpack config just looks like this. All I'm telling it is use Babel. 
because the new ES 2015, 16, etc. is cool. And that's it. This is, if you use Webpack just for JavaScript, it's, it's pretty easy to set up. Babel set up with a Babel RC file and it's just loading the ENV preset. And ENV preset is just getting the last two versions of every browser. So that is JavaScript. It's doing this mode development progress watch for development. And when it builds for production, it just goes Webpack mode production. And you're good. CSS, I'm using post CSS with some extensions. So for development, it's going post CSS uh, uh, watch. There's your entry point and exit point. And it runs that exact same command without the watch for production. And post CSS, we'll look at this post CSS RC file, which is getting post CSS import to bundle all of my stuff together. CSS next, so I can do cool stuff like variables and CSS nexting and auto prefixer and all that happy stuff. And CSS nano to shrink everything down. And that's your CSS. And I'm using uh, Browser Sync as a development server. And also I have assets. So assets just get copied. Assets are like your images and your HTML and uh, stuff like that. So I just have a couple of tiny scripts. One of them is copy for development and it just copies my assets from my assets folder over to the distribution folder and clean for production which does the same thing only it wipes out the distribution folder first so I don't have old, old crap sitting in there I don't need anymore and all those things get fired off just through npm start or yarn start and it just copies the assets and runs all that other stuff in parallel for building for production, you just do npm run build or yarn run build, copies the stuff back over, and then it runs its uh, uh, webpack and post CSS to bundle everything up. And then it does two things. These two things are very important in terms of uh, speed and, and your scores. One is it does its progressive web app stuff, which just runs a little script at the very end, which says, Look in that folder and cache everything with these extensions, except for whatever you don't want cached, and you're good to go. You're all uh, progressive web apps up. Now, before that, it runs something called critical. And this is something I haven't run before. It's, I believe it's made by Adi Asmani, or at least he's, he's a contributor to it. And Critical CSS is one of those things I always thought this is for crazy this is for crazy people that work at Google and make a site for 10 million people a minute. Critical CSS means you take the CSS that's critical for the what's on the page when it first loads and you inline that in the page. So you don't load it in an external file. It's in your HTML file. And that greatly speeds up, greatly, greatly speeds up your initial page load. Before I did critical CSS, my initial page load was like two seconds. And now it's, it's under one. And you point out your index file and I give it a destination of the same index file because that index file is sitting in the distribution folder. So it's not my source. Uh, width and height. What it does, it looks through your HTML and your CSS file and inlines your CSS and then loads the rest of the CSS later. So if you look at the source of uh, this, you'll notice there's a bunch of inline CSS and that's all above the fold critical CSS it needs. And that's what got the performance to 96 and uh, initial page load under a second. And all I had to do is point critical CSS at my index file and it did all the work. Asterisk. In order to do that, you have to do another thing, which is a best practice anyway, for when you're using reactive components. And that is populate your reactive components with what your reactive components are going to populate stuff with on the first load. So in my index file, I have this SC search component for the search component. This, uh, This is a view component. So if I just had it 
an SC search catcher tag there with nothing in that. When the page first loaded, it would you'd have a, a empty white box there, and it would sit there until all your JavaScript ran and your uh, your component was mounted. And if you're on a 3G phone, that could be a long time. That's that initial paint you got squat. So this HTML is what that component loads when it's done mounting. And I've hard coded it into that SC search component or that SC search tag that's going to catch that component. So it's already there. So when the page loads, you see that search Im immediately. You don't have a flash of nothing here in a white text box uh, that that's, you have to worry about. It's just populated. And then when the view component module loads, it replaces it with the exact same thing. So the user is no wiser. The user has no idea that something happened there, that there's shenanigans. They just know, boy, this page is really fast. So it gives you that. The other thing it gives you is if you ran something like critical on an index file, and you don't have this here, critical doesn't know that you, the styling is part of the of the critical CSS path, the above the fold stuff. So uh, you'll end up with that stuff not being styled and you'll get a flash of unstyled content, which uh, flash of most things is just bad. So you put that in there and it gives you that initial page load and it, uh, that initial paint being good and correct. Your page doesn't jump around on you as it loads and your Critical CSS can look through there and get just the stuff you need. So that is how the the performance got to 96. It's really, because it was already like low 90. It was inlining that CSS is what did it. And you can do that with just a very simple mouse script if you have your page set up correctly. So the other thing I did, well, two other things I did to get things down in size. I will say Webpack makes really tiny JavaScript too, which is nice. Uh, for the CSS, I ditched Material Design Lite, which I had been using for a long time. Uh, material Frameworks like Material Design and Bootstrap and all of that kind of stuff, they're very nice, particularly for uh, initial design work, because you don't have to bootstrap anything. It's it's You'll have some CSS frameworks. Once you get your head around the uh, uh, five to 10 CSS classes you need to put on everything to, to work, uh, you're good. Uh, but they're large. They're very, very large. And you end up using a tiny percentage of CSS that's there. And you can try to clean some of that out, but it's it's a bit of a losing struggle. Like you say, well, I, I need grid. I can ditch these other things, but I need the grid framework. You may only use 5% of that grid framework and the rest is unused CSS. And that really slows down everything. So I just material and just made my own CSS. It's based on normalize, which is kind of an, an opinionated reset. And then I just tweak from there. Like my whole grid system, I got from Tania Arasia, hope I didn't butcher that. And it's it's this, it's like 40 lines of CSS. It's just simple Flexbox and it's responsive and does everything I need. And instead of 10 classes on those HTML elements, I've got one or two and it, it works great. So that's how I got from 156 kilobytes of CSS down to 61 is ditching material I'm doing everything I was doing before plus some, and I got rid of almost 100 kilobytes of CSS. So, win. Those CSS frameworks are, they're great, especially if you're just trying to quick do a demo layout. When you go into production, I would, I would, you know, I say the first prototype you throw away, I would consider that part of the first prototype you throw away. And then, then do some regular CSS on your own. 
and if if you're if you're you're good when you do it like i've got this stuff uh sectioned out pretty much into logical classes then it's it becomes more straightforward to reuse this stuff later so you don't have to start from scratch now what i did for images is i ditched three of them well at least two of them and the other one i made better this svg image in the old sidebar used to appear with a different color right there which means it was a whole other svg image and it was a whole you know this is a fairly intricate svg image it's, it's quite large so i ditched that and went with this kind of spaced out nifty text that so that was one image the other two was for markers on the map like a you're just going to address like this marker right here and I had another marker for like a, a point of interest like that now those were separate SVG files and they're they're actually ugly SVG I don't know why I ever picked them but there were two separate files instead what I did is I took this is literally if you look up map marker SVG in Wikipedia that's it so I took that and I shrank it down with SVG Optum and then I base64 encoded it so I can stick it directly into my CSS so there's that image now it's a uh, that bit of SVG is that bit of stuff and that one image which is much smaller and inlined at least data URL are Base64 encoded inline is now the marker for both of those different types of your subject area and your point of interest. The point of interest uses the exact same SVG, it just does a filter and hue rotates it to get a different color. So these are actually the exact same SVG, one just has a hue rotate applied to it. So that let me cut out another image and shrink another one, and that's how I got my image count down quite a bit too. So those are the various techniques I did to get these scores and I am very very happy with these scores. Like I said this performance is is I think that's the end of the road for the performance. I think this is as high as I can get it unless something other cool web technology comes out. Anyway I hope you found that helpful. This site I'm still tweaking with. I have to pull it up in Internet Explorer and cry at some point. But all this code, which means all the build tooling and everything else, will be out on the GitHub repo for GeoPortal, uh, hopefully in the next week or so. Anyway, I hope you found that helpful and you found some tools you can apply to your own projects. I will get you later. Bye-bye.